Hey, welcome to Central Online. My name is Andy Beatty. I'm one of the ministers here, and we are in this series titled Our Hope. Uh, and, you know, before I start talking about some of our hope, I want to start talking about some of the things that maybe we used to believe and now we realize are, are kind of silly. Like as a kid, did anybody else ever think that inside those big box TVs, you know what I'm talking about, the wood sides, and they were, you know, they were so deep and heavy. Did you ever think that the shows, the people in the shows were actually living inside the TV? I know when I was younger, I used to think that. I used to think if you swallowed a watermelon seed, that what would happen? You'd grow a watermelon in your stomach. And now I know that uh, it's not watermelon you got to watch out for, right? Uh, uh, I used to think that if I stepped on a crack... I would break my mother's back, and that's serious stuff. I used to think that people that lived back in the 50s and the 40s and the 30s, that everything was in black and white. Not just the pictures, but that they just lived in black and white because I only ever saw black and white pictures. Uh, I also used to think when I was younger that teachers lived at the school, that they slept there, they stayed there all the time, and now as an adult I know uh, that one's still kind of true. They spend a lot of time there, uh, but I do know that I, they have homes now. When I was younger, I used to think that white cows produced white milk and that brown cows produced chocolate milk. I was like, man, why don't we see more brown cows out there? Let's, let's catch up on this. Um, and I, I also used to think when I was younger that if you were on a swing and you happened to kick and pump and kick and pump so far that you went all the way around the railing, that you would open up some sort of time vortex, time would stand still, or you'd open up a portal to another universe. I had heard rumors of kids who had done it and everything changed. You know, when we're younger, we kind of believe things based on little sayings we've heard or jokes or stories from other people. Uh, and then ultimately what happens is we kind of end up learning more about it and we realize, okay, that's, that's, not, that's not true. That's not completely true. Or maybe it's built on partial truths. Uh, see, so we're in this series about hope and we're talking about heaven. Um, and what happens though with heaven is sometimes people believe kind of little things about heaven based off of jokes maybe that they've heard or stories or Hollywood interpretations and it may seem harmless at first but what happens is it just like when we were younger it starts to kind of shape our view of those things and we start to think well this is really what it's like I'm gonna you know be waiting in this long line to check in with Peter or, uh, you know, I'm going to have to do this or that based off of some joke or, or, or movie they saw. And it may seem harmless, but I believe uh, that the devil, who is the father of lies, has a plan to, to kind of get us to believe lies about a lot of things. And I believe one of those things that he tries to get us to believe lies about is heaven. Uh, the, de- the Bible says that when the devil talks, he's a liar. Uh, when he talks, he lies. That's his native tongue. John eight forty four records Jesus saying this about the devil. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. When the devil speaks, he lies. His plan, rather than getting Christians to be terrible and to just outright refuse heaven, is to convince them of lies about heaven. Okay, and and surprisingly, the Bible says a decent amount about heaven. Uh, And I, I always kind of think it's interesting if we try to separate, like, what we think we know about heaven versus what the Bible says about heaven, uh, it's actually, it becomes, heaven becomes so much more meaningful and powerful and impactful in our life. So kind of the key text for this message is Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. And we're going to just build this basic idea of what God says about heaven off of this text. All right, Revelation 21, 1 through 7 says, Then I saw a a new heaven and a new earth. 
For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. We have to be willing to separate the lies from the truth. Now, the the reality is heaven is very hard to preach about. Paul, when he was writing to the church in Corinth, he said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So understand, as I'm talking about heaven here, I'm going to do my best to show us what scripture says about it. But Paul is saying, hey, you're probably not going to do a a good job, right? Like no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has even imagined what God has in store for those who love him, right? And yet the devil will still get you to believe this lie. The first lie I think the devil tries to get us to believe about heaven is that heaven's going to be boring. He wants you to believe that heaven is going to be boring. You know, and you think about it. I've even heard Christians, I've heard a lot of Christians say this, Like, I don't really just want to go to heaven and just worship God. I don't want to just like be floating around on a uh, a cloud like some, you know, fat, naked baby floating around, singing hymns, holding a harp, singing verses one, two, and four. You never sing verse three. Even in heaven, you won't sing verse three, right? I don't want to do that. I don't want to get in this long line on this escalator to heaven where everything's humid and wet and damp. Like today, uh, the day I'm recording this Thursday... It's supposed to be like 90 degrees and 100% humidity. It's like, I don't want to be just in some wet cloud waiting in line to get up to Peter. And then Peter's going to grill me. He's going to have to pull the manager. They're going to have to get my robes and pull out the harp. And I just, I don't know. That just doesn't sound fun to me. See, the devil wants people to believe heaven is going to be boring. And, And I think that the devil is working to do that because all of a sudden it won't look as appealing. And and the devil's working to convince people that God is boring and that church should be boring and that Christians should be boring. I don't know about you, but this last week we had our back to school party. Christians aren't boring. I hope that if you come to Central, you understand church doesn't have to be boring. I don't want to be boring. I think if we're Christians and we're boring, we're probably doing something wrong. God's word is alive. It's active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. Uh, one of the cool things that happens uh, once a month on Sunday nights, we have our business meeting the same time our refit group is having uh, their workout. And so it's so wild as we're in there with our doing our business meeting, their music is going and it's pumping. And, and, you know, there's a bunch of us just sitting in the business meeting. Pretty soon our heads are, are bopping and we're swaying just a little bit during our business, even in our business meetings. We don't want to be boring. Heaven will be the opposite of boredom. Because it's the absence of everything evil, and it's the presence of everything good. Every good gift we have is from God. Think about your favorite meal, whatever that is. Hopefully it's Chick-fil-A, right? But think about your favorite meal, whatever that is. How do you enjoy that? You enjoy that with taste buds that God created. Think about your favorite vacation destination. Think about the eyes you see that with. Who created those eyes? Think about the smell that on your favorite vacation destination or your favorite place to go. Think about who created your favorite vacation destination. Think about holding a baby, your baby for the first time. Uh, or, or like for me, I'm going to go and hold uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law's baby for the first time at some point this week. And I am so anticipating holding that baby for the first time. Who created those good, positive, happy, overflowing emotions? God did. Everything good is from God. And so the devil's lie, heaven will be boring, 
is just that. Here's God's truth. Everything good is from God. The devil wants you to think heaven is going to be boring. God is boring. The devil wants you to think Christians are boring. Church is boring. God says everything good is from God. James 1.17 says every good and perfect gift is where? It's from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He was good, he is good, and he'll always be good. Heaven is the opposite of boredom because it's the absence of everything evil. Um, you know, I, I think about some of the cool things about heaven. It's like, I'm going to recognize people there. Do you know that? There's a lot of scriptural um, uh, precedents that tells us we'll recognize one another. You can look at Luke 9 where Jesus was transfigured. You can look at the story of rich man and Lazarus. Uh, you, can talk, you can look at how Paul anticipated uh, reuniting with people in 1 Thessalonians. Two, I'm excited to see my son tank. I'm excited to see my sister Laura again and laugh about things. I'm excited to see my friends from church that have passed away very recently. Like Bob and Jean and Rick and Darlene and Mark. I'm excited to see so many more people and be reunited with loved ones. But most importantly, when I think about heaven and how everything good is from God... I'm excited to experience his love. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about God's love. If you've ever been to a funeral, you've pro or a, a wedding rather, you've probably heard 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, love doesn't envy, love doesn't boast. We love 1 Corinthians 13, especially in that context. But I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Right at the end of that chapter, he writes, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Heaven is going to be precious for many reasons. It's going to be good for many reasons. I think of the loved ones that died before us that we'll be reunited with. I think the streets of gold, the pearly gates. I think of the mansions he's preparing for us. I think of the angels surrounding the throne, worshiping day and night. But what makes heaven really special is this last part of 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Even as I am fully known. What makes heaven really heaven is the unhindered, unrestricted presence of God with us. Experiencing all of the glory of God. To know that we will know him and that we will be fully known by God. That is going to be the greatest experience of our eternal existence. Heaven will not be boring. It is a place where we will be fully known by someone who loves us in a way no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can even imagine. So that's the first lie. The second lie uh, from the devil about heaven is he wants people to believe that this world is our home. He wants people to believe this world is our home. That this life, the things you accumulate, the status you hold, the money you make, here and now is all that matters. Paul told uh, the believers in Philippians this, in, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 19. He was talking about those that didn't know Christ. And this is what he said. He said, they are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things and they think only about life here on earth. Some translations say they set their mind on earthly things. They only think about earthly things. But he goes on, and this is a great reminder for all of us. It says, but we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. The devil wants to distract us and get us to not even really think about heaven, get us so consumed with the day-to-day -day happenings here that we're no good because we just think this is it. It's all about right here. And we forget that this world is just like a mist here today and gone tomorrow. Uh, it's written in 1 John 2.16, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of the life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires, what do they do? They pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. 
the pride of life. We get so caught up in that, in earthly things, earthly status. And we start to think that it matters a whole lot about what we drive, what we wear, how we look, who we know, how many likes we get, you know, how many followers we have. That's the pride of life. And that's not going to last forever. But what happens, we start thinking this world is our home. And we put all our efforts into that and we neglect, we neglect the things that will last forever. So the devil's lie, this world is our home. God's truth, this world is not our home. Hebrews 13, 14 says, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. I guess my question would be, are we living that way? Are we truly looking forward to a home yet to come? I know for me, uh, it gets past Christmas and we start looking towards vacation. We start talking about it. We start making plans for it. We start uh, preparing for it. We're looking forward to it. Do we eagerly anticipate uh, and, and look at our plans and talk about them and make preparations for our plan knowing that this world is not our home? We have to make sure that we are ready and we're prepared and we understand and embrace that this world is not our home. We're here today and gone tomorrow. We're looking forward to a home yet to come. The third lie from the devil is this idea that most people are going to heaven. The devil is going to lie and he's going to sow this idea that most people are going to be, go to heaven. And this lie, honestly, most of us want it to be true. We really want this to be true. Have you ever wanted something to be true so bad so you just start believing it? Please understand and hear God's word on this. Take Jesus seriously when it, he's recorded in Matthew seven thirteen, saying, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Satan's lie is most people are going to heaven anyways. God's truth says forgiven people go to heaven. Heaven is not for good people. Heaven is for forgiven people. Everyone who turns from their sin confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior, is baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, and receives the gift of the Holy Spirit, can go to heaven. That's why God sent his son to die on the cross. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned. Every single one has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Me, yes. You, yes. Anybody else listening to this, yes. We're not good people. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're not good enough on our own. But verse 24 says, And all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justified by his grace as a gift. Not in our righteousness, but in, in his grace. Not in our goodness, in his grace. Not in our money, not in our status, not in our works, but in his grace. Jesus freed us from the penalty of sin, from the punishment of the cross, and he justified us, which means he made it just as if I'd never done it. We are made right with God by a gift of grace that we accept through baptism. Are most people going to heaven according to God's word? And I don't like this. The answer is no. Can anyone go to heaven according to God's word? And I do like this. The answer is yes. Anyone can go. And that's the hope that we have. We can go to heaven and experience love and contentment and, and God's glory in a way that we can't even imagine. They couldn't even glimpse God's glory in the Old Testament without dying. We get to experience that if we accept his grace. How do we do that? Well, the crowd on Pentecost had a similar question for Peter that day. How do we accept God's grace? What do we do Peter laid out one of the most simple explanations of accepting God's grace that you'll ever hear. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now you may be thinking, well, was it just them on that day, just that specific audience hearing that? 
He goes on to say, this promise is for you and your children and all who are far off. I understand that's you. That's me. All who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. Is God calling you? Remember God's truth. Remember the hope that we have. And remember his love for you. That is our hope. Love you, church.